Blaine Harden has spent a career uncovering facts. A career that started as an intern at the Spokesman Review, to foreign correspondent at the Washington Post, the New York Times, contributor to The Economist, PBS Frontline. The thought was that you could divert water out of the river up into that big ditch and then using gravity, feed that water down across the country. Hardin gets people to tell him things. The, the guy who's the subject of my book, Shin Dong Hyuk, he is the only individual known to have been born in these camps, raised in the camps, and to escape. And he brings some news about what life is like in the camps. There's two or three things that he has said that no one else has said. Hardin knows how to find stories. Ken, let me ask you, why did you dislike the great leader so much that you were willing to risk your life to get away from him? I hated the Soviet communists, and they set up the North Korean puppet regime. Well, he's an unlikely spy because he had a seventh grade education and he was a sergeant when he became the most important intelligence operative for the Air Force before, during, and after the Korean War. And now, he researches the real stories from the myths of the dead. History is written by the victors, and the textbooks we learned from had alternate facts. We are pleased to welcome a fellow historian to join us in conversation. Dr. Larry Sibula, a history professor from Eastern Washington University. His first book, Plateau Indians and the Quest for Spiritual Power, explores the interactions of Native Americans and missionaries in this time period. Join us as we welcome them both to the virtual Northwest Passages stage. Okay, stand by. There you go. Take it away, Larry. Sure. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here. As I'm told I'm supposed to say over again, I am, in fact, Larry Sapula. I'm a professor of history at Eastern Washington University. I'm also the assistant digital archive archivist for the state of Washington. We're here tonight to talk about one of the best books I've read in a long time, uh, Blaine Hardin's Murder at the Mission, uh, subtitle, A Frontier Killing, Its Legacy of Lies and the Taking of the American West. Welcome, Blaine. Oh, it's great to be here. Very good. Well, we're just happy to have gotten over those technical difficulties we were having uh, just before the curtain lifted. <laughs> so that's great. Um, let's, let's start from the view from 50,000 feet. What's your book about? Well, it, it's about a lie that I heard when I was a kid in Moses Lake. That's where I went to elementary school. And, you know, I didn't really know it was a lie for decades. Um, and when I found out, then I just started um, poking around, started at the University of Washington Library. And the thing that, that just astonished me, I remember sitting in the, in the archives and reading one day, and that this, this story that I had been told when I was in fifth and sixth grade, um, you know, state-sanctioned history and a play that, that was acted at by my, my, my fellow students, um, had actually been thoroughly debunked um, uh, 52 years before I was born. <laughs> and the Pacific Northwest, in its wisdom, had decided to continue telling its students the lie. And that struck me as, you know, something worth poking around, finding out more about. Sure. Now, your other books are quite a range of topics. I think that's one of the impressive things here. You have books about Africa, about the history of the Columbia River, about North Korea. What brought you to the Whitmans? Well, I live now in Seattle, uh, and I, uh, I've been here for about 10 years. And in the past 10 years, I've written um, three books about North Korea, which required going to Korea all the time. And, you know, it's a little... Uh, tired of flying to Korea, but I was also, I was looking for, uh, I was looking for another subject. And I'd done this book about the Columbia River and been intrigued by where I grew up, understanding more about it, uh, what it, what it meant, what it means to be an American in the West, particularly when the West is, is uh, heavily subsidized by a federal government that everybody hates. 
uh, which always struck me as interesting and worth investigating. That's what I sort of wrote about in the Columbia River book. But but also um, uh, around the time I really started working on this book, Donald Trump was elected. And um, the Washington Post has a, a, a fact checker um, who chronicled, you know, I can't even remember how many uh, documented lies that came out of the White House. And so it, it, I just thought it might be good to look back in the history of this region at, at what I discovered was a, a very long playing uh, falsehood. Very good. Well, let's dive into the book. Uh, what brought what brought Marcus and Narcissa Whitman to Washington in particular to, to where they ended up? Well, you know, they were very much people of their era, uh, like we all are, I guess. But mm. in in the 1820s and 30s, when when they came of age as 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 thinking people, the United States was uh, undergoing this enormous period of uh, of religious revival, of uh, an urge to convince your neighbor and people around the world that Protestant Christianity is the way to go. It's the only way to salvation. Um, it, 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 around the turn of the, the end of the 18th century, the 1790s, a very low percentage of Americans went to church. By 1836, which is the year that Marcus and Narcissa Whitman traveled to the Oregon country, um, by, by many estimates, 80 percent of people were going to church in in the east coast so the country had had sort of had an explosion of belief and um and and of money it contributed in church uh sunday services to send missionaries out around the world and to the foreign countries and at that time the oregon country was as foreign uh and as far away and as unknown as just about any place in the world um so Marcus and Narcissa were both pious, uh, um, uh, devout, uh, Protestant, Calvin, Calvinist Protestant Christians who came west to try to uh, save the heathen. They knew that's what they that was the term that they used to refer to to Indians, um, to tribal people, um, and the they were funded by a a Boston-based group called the um, um, American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions. And this group had seen what had happened to uh, tribal people in the southeast of the United States, uh, where the Jackson, Andrew Jackson administration had basically forced um, tens of thousands of people on uh, the Cherokee, Choctaw, Cree, and other tribes to abandon their homes and and give up everything and go across the Mississippi into quote Indian country, uh, and it, in the Northeast this was viewed as a kind of genocide, and um, the Whitmans went west to the Oregon country to prepare tribal people for the coming of lots more white people, and it was thought if they could be converted to Christianity if they could learn how to become literate, um, if they could learn the ways of, of the white men who are going to dominate them, they'd be better off. Um, and so that's, was, that was their, their, their motivation for going, that and a belief that if they worked really hard to convert um, the heathen to Christianity, that they themselves would find a place in heaven. Okay. And the Whitmans arrive out here in the Northwest and they settle down among the Cayuse. And it seems to be going very well at first, doesn't it? It, it goes surprisingly well for a year or two. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is because uh, the Cayuse were, were, as were the Nez Perce, as were many of the other tribes up and down the Columbia River, they were rather familiar with white people or at least white people's technologies. In the, in the past 150 years, a lot of change had happened to their lives. Horses had come, uh, guns, um, trade uh, in in things like wool blankets and cooking pots and steel knives, and and 
the the tribal people along the Columbia, as you know very well, Larry, because I I learned some of this from reading your book, sure. um, were were they they knew that change was afoot in in in, in a, a, a epic change was coming, um, and the the Cayuse had actually along with the Nez Perce had had some preliminary contact with Catholics, uh, uh, with with other tribal people who'd gone and trained and learned about Catholicism and had come back and taught them some, some things about the Bible, about Jesus Christ, some songs, uh, some liturgies. And so when the Whitmans arrived among the Cayuse, they were surprised that they seemed so receptive and so knowledgeable about um, Christianity. And they thought that this was, their task was gonna be much easier than they had assumed it was going to be. And I think one thing that's really interesting is why did the Cayuse want these white people on their land? And I, I think that's a really interesting question. And from talking to the Cayuse and from reading books like yours and others, um, the, the reason seems to be is that they'd found it very useful to adopt white technology, horses, guns. Uh, it had given them real power and status in, in, in their world of, of competing against other other tribes, in fact, and sometimes dominating other tribes. Um, so they they saw white people and a white God as a another um, another way to get a leg up uh, in surviving the, these these really, really changing times around them. So for a couple of years things went pretty well. Um, but over time, the Cayuse saw very little benefit from having the Whitmans uh, on their land. They saw the Whitmans building a nice house, raising some nice crops, uh, not paying any rent. Um, and, and, and then when things started to go south, they kept asking and uh, ordering the Whitmans to leave. They were sick of them around there. And they also saw that the Whitman seemed to be magnets for more white people. Mm -hmm. uh, white people kept showing up. And in, in the 1840s, in the fall of the 1840s, almost every year, hundreds more would show up in August and September, which, which um, was disturbing and infuriating. Um, so, so by 1847, when the Whitmans were killed, um, the relationship between the Whitmans and the, the Cayuse was just terrible. Uh, Narcissa had basically turned her back on any kind of missionary activity with the, with the, with the Cayuse. She was involved as a teacher and a kind of mother for uh, a large group of white and uh, mixed race children who had sort of tossed up off the Oregon Trail over the, over the preceding years. And Marcus was very much involved in welcoming white people on the, on the Oregon Trail. And he wrote a, a, an incredibly famous letter that said that white people were being fruitful and multiplying and Indians weren't. And Indians had to sort of back off and accept who, was, who, who, who the future belonged to. It's less of a mission, less than, of a mission than, than a truck farm. Than a truck farm. It, that's by, you know, after, after three or four years, I think that's a very good description. Of, and he was feeding other missionaries and feeding people who arrived on the trail, sometimes selling stuff to them. And it was 1843 when he actually leads the wagon train, train. across the mountains across the and mountains into the territory. And of course, Indians see, see that too. Right, right. Uh, and they, they just began to asso associate him with this fear of being dispossessed and dominated. Um, and that fear grew in intensity. And then it was also exacerbated. The white people brought disease, disease that didn't kill white people, but killed a lot, a lot of tribal people. And particularly Indian, um, measles in 1847, an epidemic in the autumn of 1847 was terribly, terribly uh, lethal for the Cayuse. And they watched as about half of their children died. Uh, and they also noticed that when white people got sick, they didn't die. So what did the Indians do then? Well, in, in late November, they uh, uh, a relatively small group of, of Cayuse men 
um, killed Marcus Whitman and killed Narcissa. She was the only white woman killed. And then they killed 11 other white men. Uh, and then they took hostages and in the, in the end returned all of the hostages uh, to the very, very upset uh, um, uh, white settler community over in the Willamette Valley. So the Whitman's so last, the Whitman's um, last what, 11 years? 11 there were 11 years in, in, in Oregon, yeah. At the mission. Maybe this is a good time to bring in one of their fellow missionaries, uh, Henry Harmon Spaulding. I'm not sure if your book has a hero, but it has an anti-hero, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, and Spaulding is, is, is the, uh, he's the, he's the author of The Big Lie about Marcus Whitman. Um, and he came west with them in the same year in 1836. And his backstory is that he grew up in the same community as Narcissa Whitman. In fact, he went to the equivalent of high school with her when he was in his early 20s and she was in her early 20s. Um, and he fell in love with her and proposed to her. Uh, he was from a, a ne'er-do-well family. Uh, his, his mother had not been married. Uh, and he was raised by people who would occasionally just throw him out in the street. Uh, he converted to Christianity and then went to this school where he discovered Narcissa Whitman, who was a woman of, of, uh, uh, of good family, who was uh, considered to be attractive. She had a beautiful singing voice and blonde hair, and she was very sociable. Uh, and so she propo he proposed to her, and she said, no way. Um, and a couple of years later, she met Marcus Whitman. And this is at a point where she wanted to become a missionary and he needed a missionary wife. So they got married. But in one of the, 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 the strange coincidences of, of the history of the Pacific Northwest, they all went west together uh, and often slept in the same tent on the way across the country. Um, and some historians have, have sort of tracked the, the day on which she conceived her only daughter. And this was very much at a time when they were sharing the same tent. And this, so this meant that Spaulding, who was a, a man who carried a grudge, uh, always carried grudges against lots and lots of people, who carried, and who carried a grudge against Narcissa and, and Marcus almost the entire period that they were alive, he was sleeping in the tent with them when they were conceiving a child, and it must have been very, very hard on his mental health, which was never that um, stable to begin with. In fact, I found a letter from the the head of the American Board of uh, Foreign Missionaries uh, when he was sent out to the West, and the last line of the letter, which had sort of warned him to behave himself in the West and not embarrass um, the Christian faith, the last set, the last line of the letter was, do nothing to irritate. Well, he actually spent the rest of his life irritating almost everyone he ever met. <laughs> so the Whitmans are killed, and now there's a new meaning to Spaulding's life, isn't, isn't there? He, and he, yeah. kind of he kind of turns on That's a dime from, from disliking from Marcus disliking to uh, spending the rest of his life celebrating him. Yeah, he went from tormenting them to into turning them into legends. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it, it's, it's a good point right now to talk about what is the true importance of, of the Whitman uh, killings and what is the mythical importance. The true importance is that when these 13 white people were killed and, and quite brutally killed, um, the, 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 the white uh, settler community based mostly around Oregon City and in the Willamette Valley, they were alarmed and terrified, but they also saw it as a excellent piece of news to send back to Washington and persuade the U.S. Congress to do something that it had been sort of dilly-dallying about, which was to, to declare the Oregon country to be the Oregon Territory, an official part of the United States, governed by law and with the, with, uh, the rights to have an army come and deal with Native people and all that. So when um, the Whitmans were killed in November of, of 1847, within about six or seven months, news got back to Washington. And sure enough, this killing turned to be a pivot point 
for the history of the Pacific Northwest. Congress did get off its duff and make the Pacific Northwest into a territory. Soon the president at, at the time sent out uh, an army. He sent out a governor, he sent out judges. And this part of the country was well on its way to becoming the states of Oregon, Washington, and later Idaho. So that's the real significance of the Whitmans. It wasn't anything they did while they were alive. It was what they did by being dead. Um, <laughs> The false story about the Whitmans uh, comes, uh, it sort of dribbles out at, in about the next 20 years after the killing. Spaulding had a sort of a rough life. He moved to the Willamette Valley where he was, he struggled to find work with the federal government as an Indian agent. He kept going to reservations and being told to leave because he was so irritating. Mm -hmm. um, and he, But he ended up collaborating with a couple other clerics, Protestant clerics, um, some of whom were, were very much involved in the founding of Whitman uh, uh, College. Um, and he cooked up this story that said that um, Whitman had traveled what east in 1842 um, to save the Oregon country from a British Catholic plot to steal the region uh, for the crown and to make it part of Canada. Now Whitman had actually gone east and he'd actually gone to Washington, but he'd gone there uh, for different reasons. But the story that Spalding made up is that um, Whitman got on his horse in, in, in the winter of 1842 and rode it through terrible winter snows and, and burst into the White House um, mm -hmm. and told the president at the time, John Tyler, that the British were coming, quite literally, and that America needed to send more settlers, more white settlers out, or else lose this splendid part of the country. And uh, Spalding says that Whitman was incredibly persuasive because of his leather outfit and his his determination and his uh, his uh, just honest manner. Um, the story was 80, 90 percent nonsense, but there was a there was an element of the story that that really appealed to people who heard it. Uh, what it, it so when when Spalding told this story to the people on the East Coast, it was 1871. He traveled back by train, uh, went, went to Washington and actually got the US Senate and the House of Representatives to print his phony story. Um, and it became, um, it became basically the official history of the Pacific Northwest for about three and a half decades. Um, and it was then adopted by most of the textbooks used in America, most of the textbooks used in high schools up and down the East Coast and all across the country. It was in the Encyclopedia Britannica, the Ladies Home Journal, the New York Times. It was in the New York Times several times. Um, and, it, and it was just, it was, it was bought hook, line and sinker. Spalding died in, in the middle of the 1870s, having sold this story and never having, uh, been uh, uh, repudiated for what he was, which was uh, a really first class propagandist and liar. But the reason the story was so successful, I believe, um, is because it was simple, it was hero driven, it was action packed, it congratulated Americans for being the, the, uh, the, uh, patriotic heroes that they they thought they were and it was seemed to be ordained by God himself because uh, Whitman was a missionary and so the story just had amazing legs and it was used in churches to raise money for missions it was used by Whitman College uh, around um, 1895 1896 1897 to save the college from going bankrupt um, historians at Whitman have said that without this story Whitman College would not have survived. Um, it was perfectly calculated to appeal to uh, the kind of lies that politicians continue to tell in America. They had a lot of legs, didn't they? And you're, you're probably aware that it's still used in um, homeschool curriculum. 
in some places. Oh, yeah. If you Google yeah. around, you'll, you'll still find, you'll still find it. it. Yeah. So there's this tremendous there's story this that at one point everybody in the country in the believes country that Marcus so Whitman Marcus. saved Oregon. How does that story come apart? Well, it, it comes apart spectacularly. Um, uh, it's really spectacularly. Um, in in um, there was a young University of Washington student who learned about the Whitman fable, and uh, and he sort of suspected that it was all uh, cooked up so that Whitman College could raise money, and he went back and and, and was was a graduate student at Yale. Uh, and while he was there, he started talking to his professor, uh, uh, Edward Gaylord Bourne, who was a full professor uh, of history at Yale and was um, a major player in, in a, this new discipline of scientific history, which is, you know, we don't believe what the old memories say. We, we look at the contemporaneous documents um, and we try to sift out nonsense from, from what people were actually doing and saying at the time. So Bourne began to investigate this um, and he had a wonderful resource, uh, which was in Boston, the American Board uh, uh, of Commissioners of Foreign Missionaries had saved virtually all the letters that the missionaries had written from Oregon. And there were more than 4,000 of them, uh, more than a million words. Um, and so he he examined these letters, many of which were written by Spalding, and 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 of course by the Whitmans, um, and he came to the conclusion that the the story about saving Oregon was an impossible lie, and he wrote a paper uh, that was presented in in Michigan in uh, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, at the American Historical Association in December of 1900. Um, that demolished the lie that called Spalding one of the most indefatigable old frauds in the history. And it also it, uh, accused um, a number of people who have been selling this lie of being fraudsters themselves. And it did say that Whitman College had been making money off this thing too. Uh, and it, it, it took a while. It took, it took a few years, maybe three or four years, but pretty soon in the East Coast, at least, the story of Marcus Whitman um, sort of went the way of, of George Washington and chopping down the apple tree and uh, mm -hmm. shooting the apple off William Tell's son's uh, head. And it, it just became, you know, a, a myth that did, had no more historical meaning. But that was not true, as I said at the beginning here in the Pacific Northwest. Here, the story, uh, we clung to the story in the Pacific Northwest. It was, it was, it was the best story going. And uh, it, uh, Whitman College, uh, the president of Whitman College, um, Stephen Penrose, um, he clung to it. In fact, he uh, staged these very large, uh, spectacular outdoor entertainments. Um, he did three of them over, I think, tw 10 years in a 10 year period uh, that attracted huge crowds, sometimes 20, 30,000 people from Spokane, Seattle, Portland would drive um, and, 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 and ingest this proven falsity about the history of the Pacific Northwest. And it was still in the curriculum of the schools and it was still taught to me in the 1960s. Wow, uh, I love I love the very descriptive nature of your book about this big historical, big historical fight, fight and just how bitter just some of these people so became towards each other. Towards each other. It, you know, it, it was they it was the they actually called uh, they called the people who who didn't believe in in the lie they called them anti Whitmanites, <laughs> and 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 there was one particular anti Whitman Whitmanite who was not as credentialed and as eminent as the professor at uh, Yale uh, Edward Bourne uh, his name was William I Marshall and he was a principal of a public school in Chicago who who had at one time been travel had traveled around the west and given lectures about the west but he he became obsessed with disproving the Whitman story. He spent 40 years of his life, 40 years of his life 
making dozens of trips to Washington, to the Pacific coast from Chicago, he spent all the money he made as a teacher to get gathering documents showing that the Whitman story was a fraud of extraordinary dimensions. And he was not just content to disprove the story, he wanted to humiliate everybody who believed in it. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of scholars in the Pacific Northwest who did believe in it, and, 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 and uh, Marshall went after them and called them fools and, and many worse names. Uh, and the, but he ended up writing an extraordinarily difficult to read book. It's, mm -hmm. it's more than 800 pages, two volumes, and it probably sold six copies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. But I read it, and it has everything you wanted to know about the lie. Um, and he, he ended up uh, uh, absolutely uh, you know, crucifying everybody who believed in it. But then again, nobody paid any attention in the Pacific Northwest to him. I spoke um, a lot, two, two summers ago to a past president of Whitman College. In fact, he was one of the longest serving presidents of the college. And I asked him, what did he think of William I. Marshall, the man who had done 40 years of work to demolish the Whitman legend? He said, I never heard of the guy. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it, it, was, it, was, it was for us in the Pacific Northwest, we simply did not want to not believe this. Um, and I think there's an analogy um, that I think is fair. Um, I mean, part of it has to do with the, the Pacific Northwest is a pretty progressive part of the country. Um, at, at least it fancies itself. So if, if you live in, in, uh, in between Seattle and Portland, um, but um, this story about the Whitmans and the, uh, the, the way that the story sort of demonized the Cayuse, um, it, 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 it's, it has an analogy, analogy, I think, to how Southerners think of the Civil War. Um, around the turn of the 20th century, um, uh, the Civil War was sort of reimagined as a war fought for reasons other than the reasons it was fought for. Mm -hmm. It was fought for uh, as a, a principled defense of, of state rights. Um, and by golly, it was, that was, the principles were there and the people who believed in those principles, we should honor them. And so all across the South, statues went up of uh, various generals who served in the Civil War on the, on the Confederate side. Um, and wouldn't you know it, in the Pacific Northwest, we have decided, we decided in 1953, 53 years after the Whitman story had been thoroughly debunked by the most eminent scholars in the country, we decided to put this statue up in the U.S. Capitol as an example of the finest in manhood who'd ever lived in the state of Washington. Um, and the statue is also in the, in the, in the Capitol in Olympia. And there's one on the on the campus of Whitman College, which is uh, um, the students now are trying to get rid of. And of course, the statue in the Capitol Olympia are on their way out, aren't they? That's right. That's right. It it, it really happened very quick. Uh, mm -hmm. The the proposal to to remove that statue came up um, about a year and a half ago, and it went nowhere. And then it came up three months ago, and it was passed almost overnight, astonishingly quick. Um, and the statue will be removed uh, uh, sometime this summer and replaced uh, with one that's still being forged of Billy Frank Jr., a, uh, um, uh, a tribal man from the, um, from the West Coast, from the West side of the Cascades, who was arrested more than 50 times trying to uh, uh, enforce treaty rights that were in, embodied in federal law, and who is at this time uh, a, a much better person for a statue than Whitman. Good. I was uh, teaching a course a couple of years ago at Whitman College, and um, the first day of the course was Columbus Day, and I took the students out for a walk around campus to talk about public history. Public history. And some students, yeah, some I think students, Jesse I think may have Jesse. a picture of this, some students had done a little stenciling on the sidewalks. Um, I don't know if you've, you've seen this. Let me see if I can get okay, I'll, maybe we'll come back around to that. I have some questions from the audience. I'm, I'm getting some motions I'm supposed to read here. So excuse me while I look down a little bit at this. 
Um, Katz asks, as a substitute teacher in a school with a Native American population, I dreaded lessons that involved a softened version of our interface with Native Americans, only, often only a paragraph or two long. How do we get the false narratives out of the classroom? Well, you know, the, the one of the, the, the true narratives are so much more interesting. Um, just just the story of this grand lie and uh, the guy who made it up and who the Whitmans were and how they interfaced with the Cayuse and why the Cayuse wanted them there in the first place. Uh, it's really interesting. It's completely human. It's rich and it you know it happens to be true. Um, mm -hmm. And you know I, I I just think that there's there there's a lot to be written about these relationships. Um, that uh, you know would would be compelling for students to learn, and also I think one of the th I've been reading a lot about the uh, how uh, early Americans uh, dealt with the tribal people that they found on the East Coast, and they came to the conclusion very early on that these were our equals in terms of being human, having, having a right to their property and to the civil rights that other people have. And those, those uh, principles and ideals were written into federal law and became part of how the United States and into the many, many, the more than 260 treaties that were signed between the federal government and and the various tribes across the country. Now we, we had our ideals and we had our laws and then we also then stole 90% of the land at the same time. So there's this incredible tension between our ideals as people who, who sort of had founding fathers who were uh, uh, enriched by Rousseau and Locke and, and all of these, uh, these wonderful principles of the enlightenment. And yet we were greedy people who wanted land to, for wealth. And the tension between those two things has played itself out over the past 250, 300 years in the country with, with tribal people for a very long time being utterly destroyed. But right now we're in a period of our history where their rights are being honored under federal law. Mm -hmm. And many tribes, including the Cayuse and, and the Walla Walla and the Umatilla who live on the Umatilla reservation, they are in a better position vis-a-vis uh, the wh dominant white culture than they have been for maybe since since the Whitman showed up. And I think that the arc of that history is incredibly interesting and you know a great thing to teach in public schools. I admire the way the last chapters of your book are about the Cayuse and the Cayuse today, uh, that they don't disappear from your story um, after the killing of the Whitmans. A question from Bill, have you read George, George Fuller's account of the killings? He describes the Nez Perce part in protecting the Spaldings and assisting them to the Willamette Valley. Was that part of Spaulding's fabrication? You know, I just don't know that. Okay. I, I, I don't know. Um, Jake asks, would you say the Catholics or Presbyterians had greater lasting success among the Indians of the Pacific Northwest? I think the Catholics um, had, had a better strategy. Um, and it's not because I went to Gonzaga. Um, I'm not Catholic, but uh, I think they they were uh, as I as I write in the book, they were lighter on their liturgical feet than the than the Calvinist Protestants. They did not demand the impossible from people who were struggling to learn uh, uh, the complexities of Christianity and struggling to learn English uh, uh, and struggling to read in any language. Um, what what they what they uh, they basically baptized first and asked questions later. And the Whitmans, particularly Marcus and Narcissa, they would not baptize anybody. They were there for 11 years on the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, at their mission. And the, the tribal records show that they succeeded in baptizing two people. And I think both of those people were actually baptized by Spalding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these, these, these were not effective missionaries. And I think that's also part of what propels the big lie, an effort to give meaning to the deaths of the Whitmans. And the right. meaning isn't going to be, well, look at all the natives they converted because they weren't good at that. 
Um, they weren't the, good at that. They, they spent a lot of time uh, uh, paddling on each other and fighting with each other. In fact, uh, in uh, the reason that Whitman went back to Boston, the reason he rode his horse uh, east was because he had been told in a letter from Boston that they had been squabbling uh, and tattling so much that they were an embarrassment to the American Commission uh, of Foreign Missionaries. And they were, uh, several of them had been basically fired, including Spalding. Um, so he, his, his motive for, for going back East was not to save Oregon, it was to save his own hide. Mm -hmm. It's the one, we kind of sailed right past it, but it's a wonderful part of your book where you show how these missionaries seem, the reason there's a million words in these letters is they're all writing back to Boston uh, putting each other down uh, in the most exactly. in the most brutal terms. Uh, yeah, in, in in ways that were not Christian. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Uh, very good. Um, oh, we have a last question here for you. I think it's from Auntie's Books, which of course is where everybody watching this should go to Auntie's Books immediately and buy <laughs> Murder at the Mission. Don't order it from Jeff Bezos. He has plenty of money already. Support your local uh, independent bookstore. Um, but the last question is, what are, what are you reading right now? You know, I'm reading Hemingway. Um, I watched the Hemingway, the three-part thing, the, the, the Burns series on PBS. And I'd, I'd gone all the way through my life without reading hardly anything from Hemingway. And so I, I, I'm reading uh, Farewell to Arms. And uh, I think it's pretty good. Okay. Boy, I can't stand Ken Burns, but it's not, uh, I'm not the guest here today. Well, thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you, Blaine. We're going to end with North, the Northwest Passages raffle. And we'll be raffling off a copy of the book to one lucky uh, viewer. Um, so with that, I'm going to give it over to Jesse, who's going to spin go. the wheel. Brandon Clark. <laughs> Brenda Clark, come on down. Well, don't come on down. We're all going home right now. But uh, the spokesman will get you your book. Okay. Right. Well, thanks, everyone. I guess, that's, I guess that's it for tonight. Thank you, Blaine. Thank you, Larry.